like Rich said, I think we often, and I love what Dale said, is I think as believers, we often just kind of go with the flow and we don't find out why we do the things that we do. And, and why do we have Easter eggs? Why do we do Christmas? Why do we do Easter? And there are some unhelpful reasons why I think we do do those things and how we've brought in pagan you know, practices into these spaces as opposed to appropriating the things that Jesus had spoken of and that speaks of him. And uh, I love 1 Corinthians 15 because it says that if uh, the resurrection is not true, then we as believers need to be pitied among all men. Because if it's not true, then what do we have? Then as Rich says, we literally are living zombies and we might as well, you know, eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. And that's all that we're left with, which is a life that is without hope. And so hopefully this morning, excuse the pun, um, I'm going to show you the hope that we have in the resurrection. You see, this word gospel, it means the word evangelion, or the Greek word is evangelion, which means the gospel, the good news. And we talk about this good news and we talk about the gospel, but really what it was in, in those days was that when you said the gospel of Caesar Augusta, what it was talking about was people were so uh, pleased to have this new uh, Roman emperor who was now going to take on the world and bring peace to the land and all of those kind of things, even though they did it violently and they would do that. And not so much for the oppressed of the Roman Empire, but it would be the good news of now a new Caesar or a new emperor coming into play. Or they would celebrate his birthday because of who he is to the land. The other way the good news was used was when a, a messenger who would herald that good news where you had these enemies that were on your boundary lines of, of your, your territory and they were coming to invade you. But what would happen is you would overcome them and this messenger would come and herald the good news of the victory. And that's what this word gospel, evangelion, which sounds so much better, doesn't it? Um, well, you've got to say it in the Greek, is evangelion. But the point is, is that most people at that particular point in time would have seen that that's what that word would have meant, as opposed to those who were Jewish and had read their Bible. And especially if they, in those days, they would read the Greek Bible, not the Hebrew Bible. Who knows what the Greek Bible was called? Not you. The Septuagint. And why they say that, but there's a reason why they call it that. The point is, is that they would have understood that this would have pointed back to the book of Isaiah. And uh, they would have gone to this particular text. I don't know why this thing didn't work. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring Evangelion, who proclaim peace and bring good news, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. And that was what would have taken the Jewish people back there or those who had read the Greek Bible. And then the followers of Jesus would have kind of, they, they would have re remembered what Jesus would have said. And in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, it says, The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Repent and believe the Evangelion. This amazing news. This news that's almost too good to be true, but it is. And so in all of this, what Jesus was evoking was this Isaiah good news that would confront the so-called good newses of people that were on planet, Project Planet Earth at the time. People would say, oh, the good news of Caesar Augusta now being emperor. And he, he, what he was trying to do was Jesus was evoking, though, actually, there is a good news. There is an Evangelion which is greater than that of what the world produces. And so what Isaiah was actually saying, and if you go read Isaiah 42 to 55, Isaiah was saying that God has got this plan in place. And this is an amazing plan. It's a, it's a plan of good news. And he longs to redeem Project Planet Earth from the way that it is kind of the trajectory in which it has flown. And it's now the time that he is doing so. And so this plan, as I said, is stated in Isaiah. The thing is, I guarantee you that most people here would understand the gospel to be, we're all sinners. Jesus died on the cross for us, and we've just sung about it, which is all true. And he died in our place because actually the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life for those who believe in Jesus. And so what would happen then is when I do believe in him, then I get the tickets, I give the right to go to heaven. Right? That's what most people believe the good news to be. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like great news to me. I mean, yes, okay, my sins are forgiven, but... Actually, what is going on in terms of this whole process? 
Because we, as most Christian believers, it's kind of what I would call evacuation theology. That's why the rapture has so much traction in our society. God's going to take us out from all of the Armageddon and all the, the pain. That's not true. Go read the Bible properly. Armageddon doesn't happen. The bloody lamb walks in and we're doing that series on Revelation, which we get back to next week. But the point is, is that what most people believe is, no, get me out of this place. I want to get saved. I want a savior. I don't want Lord, but I want a savior to get me out of this place. Give me the ticket to heaven. And that's how we live our lives, longing for heaven as opposed to actually living our lives out on earth. And so it's this thing of we're so heavenly minded that we really know earthly use at all. Or we have the vampire theology, the blood of Jesus. Again, these are, there are truths here, so don't, I don't want to minimize these things. I want to exalt something else in a moment. But it's this vampire theology, the blood of Jesus. If we've got the blood, then, then that rem is the remission of sins and, of course, all of those good things. But evacuation and vampire theology are not the true gospel, the good news of Jesus. And that's why Paul defines it in Romans chapter 1, and he says, The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in the power of his resurrection. From the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through him we have received grace of apostleship to call all the Gentiles, now notice this, to the obedience that comes from faith. I'm going to come into the back to this in a moment. But most, what hap, most, most believers, they go to that the fact is, is that I need to obey before I have faith. But actually obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among the Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. So the point of the gospel is Jesus is calling us under his lordship, under his headship, into his kingdom where he is king. And he's asking us to turn away from idols, to repent and to believe and to trust in him. And it's not about kind of escaping this world, like I've already said, but it's about establishing his rule and reign here on Project Planet Earth now. That's why Jesus said, my kingdom, the kingdom of God has near, has come near. It is now. It's now, but it's not yet. And that's why we often feel schizophrenic as Christians. You see, we can be present gospel people right now. We don't have to wait for heaven. We don't have to go, well, oh, one day when I get to heaven. No, no. We can actually live in the kingdom of God now, carry the gospel as gospel people, and be examples of this new creation, and actually dispense of it wherever we go, and wherever we move, and wherever we have our being. I don't know why this thing keeps shouting at me. Now, the fact is Jesus is the gospel. He is the good news. He is the one that carries it. He was the one who announced it, but he didn't just stop there. He actually did it. I think too many of us as Christians talk about the gospel, but don't do it. Don't operate in the power of the Holy Spirit within inside of us to actually present this new creation and this good news to the people out, of, out there in the world. In fact, a lot of Christians look like they drink a lot of lemon. And they need some aid so that they are a bit sweeter than they normally should be. See, the, the gospel isn't about something that will happen to us. The gospel is about a new reality that's already been born. It's the energizing power of Holy Spirit, the resurrection power that resides within us as believers and helps us be those gospel people, that we are the signs of the good news, that we are the people that carry this, and we, are, we actually infect people with the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And the good news is that the resurrection of Jesus proves and proclaims he's redeeming and transforming of creation. And that's why when we do Revelation and we get to the end of Revelation, we're going to see God renews heaven. God renews a new earth and brings us into that space. Now, here's an interesting thing. The early church, forgiveness was not the main part of their salvation and gospel message. And what proves this is that there was a, really the late emergence of the cross that came into culture and came into Christian art. And I'll show you in a moment, but Santa Sabina was built in AD 430. That was the first time that anybody can actually prove that there was a cross used as a depiction of Christianity. This is the picture. And look at where it is. <laughs> These are doors 
And I haven't shown you Santa Sabina. It's a, it's a kind of a, almost a complex church complex. But this is the, all it is, and there it is there. First time ever. So they didn't use the cross as something that they would proclaim. They didn't wear it around their necks. It would be like having a guillotine around your neck. It would be like having an electric chair or carrying lethal injections with you. That's what it would be like. The point is, is the crucifixion was clearly not the most encouraging way to get people to turn to Jesus because of how grotesque and how much it was used in those days. And Louise spoke about that last week. And she set up this preach because actually that's what you would have seen. The streets littered with crucifixions. Corpses. Birds eating the corpses. I know I'm being, but that's what would it have been. So now you're going to use that as a, come on, turn to Jesus. This is the gospel. The thing is, the early church was more concerned with miracles, signs, and wonders, and the, the hopeful aspects of our faith, the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. And if we don't understand that, then you know, the resurrection doesn't become the point, but the death of Jesus does. Whereas the early church was more focused on the resurrection of Jesus as the central message of the gospel. Whoa, how was that? <laughs> but they didn't avoid the message of the cross either. Because a lot of people thought, well, let's stay away from death as I've just described it. But here's Tertullian, one of the early church fathers, and he was um, uh, an apologist of the time. And how's this? He writes a letter to the provincial Roman governors, and he said, proceed in your career of cruelty, but do not suppose that you will thus accomplish your purpose of extinguishing the hated sect, the Christians. We are like the grass which grows the more luxurious, luxuriantly the more often it is mowed. The blood of Christians is the seed of Christianity. Your philosophers taught men to despise pain and death by words, but how few their converts compared to those of Christians who teach by example, gospel people carrying the gospel wherever they go. The very obstinacy with which you abrade us is the greatest propagator of our doctrines. For who can behold it and not inquire into the nature of that faith which inspires such supernatural courage? Who can inquire into that faith and not embrace it? Who can embrace it and not desire himself to undergo the same sufferings that he may thus secure a participation in the fullness of the divine favor? How's that for a... Those are big words. But ultimately, what does it mean? It means that Jesus' life and not his death is the point. That actually the followers of Jesus and the late emergence of the cross, it wasn't because they were afraid of death. They actually gave their lives. They actually had more courage and it was Jesus' life and the demonstration of his life and the demonstration of the kingdom in his life that drew courage for them to live out the life of the gospel. It wasn't his death. And it's important for us to understand that because if we don't understand that, then we don't understand that the resurrection and the post-events of the resurrection, it actually proved the indestructibility of the life of the kingdom. That Jesus spoke of it, Jesus demonstrated it, but not only that, he demonstrated it and it was validated and he was vindicated by his resurrection. That actually that life is indestructible and it is true. And all the teachings and everything about his life were true. You see, what happened then was, as people who witnessed the life of Jesus, who witnessed his resurrection, who witnessed all of those things, as they started to die off, the future generations stopped focusing on the life of Jesus and started to focus on his death. Now, let me say right up front, of course, the cross of Jesus and the beauty, despite its grotesqueness of what it means to us as Christians, we must not forget. But when we elevate it above the resurrection, we stay at the cross. We stay with our guilt and shame. And we stay here and we say, well, Jesus did this for me. But thank you, Jesus. And Jesus becomes our Savior, but not our Lord. We've got to move beyond the cross. Yes, acknowledge it, but move beyond it into the life and the life of abundance that Jesus has actually purposed us. So the cross is the means to which the resurrection then vindicates the purpose for which he did all of what he did. So he lives the perfect life, the sinless life that death could not hold him. He dies the most horrific death for us and takes upon the sins of humanity upon himself. He gets buried into the ground for three days, but then he gets raised to new life 
as a prototype of what will happen to us. And so salvation is not just mere forgiveness of sins. And that's the problem is when those generations died off, that's all they saw was, oh, well, it's Jesus' death for us, the forgiveness of sins, so I can get to heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not the gospel. If that's what you believe, I implore you this morning to change the way that you're thinking. See, rather than living in the kingdom now and living in the gospel as gospel people now, bringing hope to this world through the resurrection of Jesus, actually what we need to understand is the resurrection was the thing that broke the power of sin over humanity, not his death. His death paid for it, but his resurrection is where we receive the power. You see, we need a paradigm shift in our understanding of what this good news is. And it's important because otherwise it shifts our redemptive relationship with Jesus. That Jesus, as I said, just becomes our savior. And everybody wants a savior. Everybody wants a hero. That's why we have Marvel and, and all of those DC stuff. And we want the hero. We want the one with the power to come in and save. But actually what we don't want is somebody as Lord, where we bow our knee and we say, Jesus, you are Lord alone. You are God and there is no other. And otherwise what happens is the cross just becomes this mere place of suffering. And then ultimately, it comes to the, mis the overall mistaken identity of Christians as that's what describes us, that actually that's the only part of the redemptive acts of God. No, no, no. Yes, it's a big part, but the bigger part is the resurrection of Jesus. And otherwise, what happens is, is Jesus' life and his teaching and who he was becomes the non-essential part of our Christian walk. And we proclaim his death on, on Easter and we proclaim his birth at Christmas, but I think we should have another celebratory thing of actually celebrating his life. If you go and read Romans chapter 5, it says we are saved by his life, not just his death. It shifted the trajectory of the church. Once this kind of all about the cross came into play, and even if you go into um, you know, the, Re the, the Reformation, you see Calvin and Luther and everything else, what they did is they elevated this thing of redemption, the atonement that actually was all about the forgiveness of sins. And of course it is. I'm not, I don't want to minimize that. I want to even increase that. But what I want to increase more is the resurrection of Jesus this morning. In your minds that without the resurrection, the cross, well, how many people died on the cross? But how many people rose from the dead after dying on the cross? Isn't that the point? And I honestly feel that the people here this morning, that actually within their lives, they are stuck at the cross. Which on one level, yes, it's beautiful. But on another level, you just stay there and you don't live in the life that Jesus wanted to bring you into abundance. And God is saying we need to be the gospel people that he's created us to be under him as Lord of the kingdom, that he is king of that kingdom. And if we operate in that and we allow that gospel to come and change us from within, we will become those people that actually bring hope to society rather than die in our own hopelessness because we just stuck at the cross. Thomas Aquinas, also one of the early church fathers, was walking in the splendors of Rome with a mate. And his mate said to him, Thomas, isn't it amazing that we don't have to say silver and gold have we none as the church anymore? And Thomas turned to him and he says, yeah, but the problem is, is neither can we say in the name of Jesus of Nazareth to the lame man, get up and walk. The church has lost its power because it focuses only on the forgiveness of sins as opposed to the miracles and signs and wonders that the kingdom of God brings when we as a people celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ and live in the life and the life of abundance that he has pro propagated for us. The resurrection validated the kingdom life, not just the forgiveness of sins. Because when the church just becomes the dispenser of the forgiveness of sins, we lose the life force of the kingdom, which is the resurrection power of Jesus Christ that comes through the Holy Spirit who resides within us. I know I keep saying this, but the, the gospel is not only of the forgiveness of sins. It is of the life that comes and the abundant life that comes from the resurrection of Jesus. Again, which proved who he is. Jesus was not dead. And when we die, we will be resurrected again in due time when he comes back and ultimately brings about the consummation of this age. 
where we are the resurrected ones of Jesus. And that is the earth-shattering gospel, the evangelion of this world, is that Jesus, because of his resurrection, we too will not die. We, this body will die, but we will not die because it is already proved. Now look at the central gospel, of, the central message of the gospel. Look at those texts. I have come that you may have life and life in abundance. Jesus said to her, and this is at the, the resurrection of, um, of Lazarus, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Lifehouse Church this morning, visitors to Lifehouse Church this morning, do you believe this? John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Where's the forgiveness of sins in this? If we focus on the forgiveness of sins, we then what happens is when we fail, we continue to look inside and we continue to be internal rather than external about dispensing the life that God has given us. John 5, 1 John 5, 11, and this is the testimony that God has given us, eternal life, and, that he, and, and this life is in his son. Who had, ah, he who has the son has life. And Ephesians chapter 2, one of my favorite texts, it says, because of God's great love for us, a God who's rich in mercy, he made us alive in Christ, even though we were dead in our transgressions and our sins. When we reduce the gospel simply to the atonement, we are never able to operate in the kingdom living now. The kingdom of God is available to us now. It's already, but not yet. I get that. And sometimes we feel, like I say, schizophrenic because we... God, we feel the kingdom of God. We feel his presence. And then, oh, I don't feel anything at all. Sometimes we feel like we're on top of the world and we can take on anything. And then other times we feel like, God, take me now. And we live in that schizophrenic kind of setup. But the point is, is that we, we can't reduce the gospel simply to the forgiveness of sins. Because then what will happen is, is we, we start to tag on this obedience and works and all of these things onto the grace of God. You are saved by grace through faith. Well, say by grace through faith. Always get that mixed up. Again, I want to implore you this morning. Let's move beyond the cross to the abundant life that God has given us. Yes, we celebrate that our sins have been dealt with and paid for. But the purpose of it is that we can live a life and a life of abundance and be a gospel people dispensing the life of God to this world that so desperately needs it. To finish off, I want to just run through this text. I want someone to read it though, so that my voice, uh, Nix, why don't you read for me? I'll grab it here as well. Praise be to God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Thank you. Now, did you notice all of what was said there? What's the first place Peter goes to? Resurrection. 
Like, who was Peter? Well, number one, he was one of the first disciples of Jesus. He was a fisherman off the coast of Galilee. He was quite an impetuous man. As you know, he did some crazy things. He also uh, was one of the few that, that kind of betrayed Jesus three times on the night before Jesus was cru crucified, he denied Jesus. He was one of the first, though, at the empty tomb. If you go read there, the women were there first. And then they run back and they tell, and he just take, picks up his cloak and he runs there and he gets there. He was one of the few, well, not few, but there were, there were hundreds of people who experienced the risen Christ. And he was one of those who would have experienced and were eyewitnesses to the risen Christ. He had a fish briar where he jumped out the boat and he saw Jesus. And Jesus was brying a nice bunch of fish for him. And where he actually said to, to Peter, I want you to go feed my sheep. So he was a man that was very close to Jesus and arguably the leader of the disciples as well. Now it's decades later. He's a leader in the context of this new way. It was called the way, by the way. Excuse the pun. He was a missionary. He was a church planter. He was a preacher. He was all of those things. And what he's doing is, just like what we went through in, in, um, in our Revelation series, where John was actually proclaiming this to the people to encourage them, is in the same way Peter's doing the same thing. Christians are being persecuted. Christians are even being killed because of what they believe. The Roman Empire didn't know what to do with them. The people who were still part of the Jewish kind of setup didn't know what to do with them. And they continued to kill Christians throughout this time. They were harassed. They wouldn't, be, they wouldn't trade with them. They, was, they struggled to make ends meet. All of these things that were happening. And what is the first thing that Peter does? What is the first thing that he does to encourage them? He reminds them of the resurrection of Jesus. I want to say to you, church, if you're struggling, I want to remind you of the resurrection of Jesus this morning that we celebrate today, that Jesus was raised from the dead by the power of Holy Spirit, and he is far above every power, dominion, or any title that can be given. And he is head of the church. And you know what? We are the church, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. You see, he understood that in all of this, that he saw the world very differently after the resurrection of Jesus. Can you imagine, and I'm pretty sure many of us have experienced this, and maybe even this week, where something has gone down in your life and you feel like death has come. Maybe there's a death to relationship. Maybe there's a physical death to somebody you love. Maybe there's a death to many different aspects of your life. Can you imagine the disciples? Remember on the road to Emmaus? They are, they're like, oh, we thought Jesus was the Messiah. But he's gone now. He's dead. We thought he was going to bring peace, but he's gone. Can you imagine what Saturday would have felt like? And then all of a sudden Sunday comes and the celebration of the life and the risen Christ. And so part of this process is Peter realizes that God's purposes for us as humanity are, is far bigger and far more reaching and far reaching than he ever thought was possible. And I want to say to you all this morning, the resurrection of Jesus Christ validates all of what he said about the kingdom. And we can live in that now if we choose to. See, it reshapes the world. It reshapes the future of this world. It reshapes your future if you were allowed to do so. You see, the resurrection, if you saw there, it's a living hope. It's a dynamic hope. It's not a hope that's, oh, okay, great. But actually, as you think about it, and as you meditate on the resurrection of Jesus, what it does is it's not just about a historical event, but what it does is it gives us the propensity and it, and it changes us, it transforms us from the inside out. It changes the way we look at the world. And even in whatever you might be in right now, it might be a health issue, it might be a relational issue, it might be a work issue, it might be an economic issue, whatever it might be, you will see the world very, very differently and you will become the gospel carrier that despite your circumstances, you will be joyful and you will be filled with an inexpressible glorious joy that Peter talks about. Because the hope of the resurrection rises inside of you and it gives you new lenses to see the world for what it really is. And the worst thing that can happen to you is you die. And you open your eyes and there's Jesus. That's why what Peter's saying is that hope does something to you. And you know what? Humanity, psychologically, the psychologists say we are a 
species, creatures that need hope in order to give us meaning and purpose to carry on in every aspect of our life. And Peter's saying that no matter what your suffering is, no matter where your pain is, no matter what it is, is the hope of the resurrection will get you through it. And lastly, this is what the resurrection is. Number one, it's an invitation. For every single person here, for those who do believe and for those who are on the edge and don't know whether they fully believe, and we'll invite you into that moment, a, a space to, to make a choice. Because if you choose to accept it, guess what? You will be changed from the inside out. And the only way to describe you would be that you are born again because you are so different from what you used to be. And that's why Jesus says to Nicodemus, you need to be born again. And I know that born again, are you a born again Christian? I used to hate that term. Are you a born again Christian? What do you mean I'm born again? But actually I'm starting to understand the beauty of what it is. I want somebody to say, Gary, you're very different from what I knew about you 10 years ago. Gary, you're full of hope despite your circumstances. Gary, there's something about you that I don't understand why you are the way that you are because actually when I look at your life, things are not all perfect. And I can turn around and I can give them the hope for which I have, which is the hope that the resurrection gives me a living and dynamic hope. Number two, it's a gift. It does make it possible to have this living hope to carry on and enables me to navigate all the moments and seasons and, and even death, no matter what suffering and pain that I might be going through. And then thirdly, it's a life reimagined. It's this kingdom living that we become a gospel people that in light, we start to live in light of eternity, not evacuation theology, that we live to the fullness now, that death is merely a veil through which I walk through into a new beginning where God, the consummation of this age, will bring about a renewed heaven and a renewed earth because our hope, ladies and gentlemen, is in the resurrection. And let's keep that front and center this morning and as we go into this week and into the rest of this year, if we hold that up, no matter what is going on in front of us, I honestly believe we will be able to navigate that as the gospel people that God's called us to be. So let's stand. Let the team come up.